the nature of React has almost amplified this problem, what it doesn't exist because of the nature of how collaborative and how community focused React and the React development experience is. That they wouldn't click or interact with the, the sandboxes at all. They thought they were photographs of code, uh, that they were screenshots. This is, this is how much Medium has ruined the developer education experience and the concept of enough. Uh, Let's do because it. It means different things to different people in different situations. And there are frameworks like OKRs and KPIs that are designed to measure impact. But really what you're measuring is, is it enough? Howdy, howdy, y'all. Super excited about Web Dev Wednesday today. I couldn't imagine a more exciting guest for us to have. Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself quick? Hey, everybody. I'm Rachel Lee. I'm the uh, uh, Technical Program Manager leading developer education at AWS Amplify. And it's so good to see you today. Fantastic to have you, Rachel. For those who have been here for a bit, the one thing you know about me is I really love the new React documentation. I've went on a handful of rants about it on stream, on Twitter, and all over the place. I think it's a phenomenal example of the types of resources that really help developers get started on the right foot and get to the get into the habit of loops that make them love development way earlier in their careers. And it was so exciting to start chatting with you, Rachel, and to get to have you on the show. So first and foremost, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for all the hard work you did at Meta. And yeah, great to have you here. Somebody said increase volume for Rachel. Can you talk a bit more quick to see if the levels are good? Sure. Um, so uh, I'll start introducing myself from way back in the day. I used to be a, um, I used to live in the middle of nowhere on a farm. I made comics for teenage girls and it was the only connection I had, not unlike today, not unlike the entire pandemic we, ex we just lived through. The internet was the only connection I had to other people. Uh, so I got really good at building online communities using the Drupal and um, you know, made, we didn't have Etsy. So when I wanted to sell comic books to people, physical comic books, I had to install OS Commerce. When I wanted to make a newsletter, I didn't have MailChimp. We email newsletters as a service, that's enterprise. Um, no, I had to install Team Can PHP. So I ended up coding to, um, to connect with the world around me. And to, to a great part, to a great extent, I still believe in the internet's power of connecting people and people's ability to build their own communities, for better or for worse. I think we're good now. I can, I can keep yeah. living. Your background right. is super interesting, and like, I almost want to say it's like the Tumblr-ish version of what I did, where it, I did the same, but with Minecraft, where I oh. wanted to play Minecraft with my friends. All my friends were very mean, so I needed ways to keep them from breaking my stuff. And I also had to learn how to code enough to build our website, which I did in WordPress. So I had like the WordPress website for the server. I had plugins I built in Java to sync that with our server. And I had to learn a bunch about Git and SSH and like remote server management just to keep the server up and to roll back the destruction that my friends would wreak on us. So it very similar in the sense that like I needed this thing to do with my friends. For me, it was because I had an injury, so I couldn't skateboard as much and ski as much as I used to. And that was the only thing I really had was playing Minecraft with my friends. And it's crazy how that like it's almost like the limit from the outside of like there's a reason why the Internet is your outlet. Once you have that limit, you realize the limitless nature of the Internet in a way. Yeah, I think that's something that not everybody realizes when they come online. I mean, I remember there was this, I'm probably one of the like last number people in, of my generation who can remember the transition between not having internet and having the internet because it took so long to come to rural American mountain towns. Like we were just within the last two miles of the, uh, uh, of the last relay station for the telephone company. And if we'd just been a little further off, the signal wouldn't have reached us. So it finally climbed up the mountain. And I remember it was like, one day I was wandering around in the forest and the next day I was on the doorstep of the world and it was night and day. And you really, it, it, it's powerful to have that moment when you realize how connected you are and you don't really take it for granted. You're like, oh my God, I'm here. I could do anything. 
anything at all. And, and that's the, that's kind of a glorious thing. Absolutely. I remember in skateboarding when I was like, trying to learn tricks that nobody where I was from knew because I saw them in a Tony Hawk game, but they were weird, obscure tricks from the 80s and no one knew how those worked anymore. And then I found it was way before YouTube. I think it was like stage six or something. It was like an XVID site for the old like DivX codex. And there was various tutorials from older freestyle skateboarders that they just filmed on VHS, ripped and put online in terrible quality. And when I realized that this treasure trove of I can learn any trick on my skateboard just by searching the right words in this weird terminal and scrolling through enough pages. That realization got me hooked so early. And it's crazy how, like, that's just the default now, in a way. And I think I was right at the end there, too. Well, it was like, I'm from a farm town as well, but also didn't have that technical of a background when I first started really using the internet. And saw how it complemented the non-technical parts of my life so well. I love that. You know, I still go and watch videos about farmers and the techniques and tools that they found to like build better chicken coops. It's, it's, um, you know, it's like my evening, my evening, uh, happiness. It's so nice to see how a farmer in India can give qu uh, tips for raising quail to farmers all over the world. Uh, I get a lot out of, out of poking around this. But back in the day, when I first started building, uh, my biggest limiting factor was actually I didn't have access to any knowledge. Uh, I had wanted to be a games developer when I was but a wee thing, but I couldn't find any books on how to program in my local library. I was just incapacitated. I was like, well, I guess that's not for me. I had a computer, but I, I loved playing games on it, but I didn't know how to build them. It was actually Amazon that made it possible for me to start building for the web because there were these HTML quick start guide books that Peach Pit Press used to put out back in the day. And they were kind of like MDN in a book, back when you could fit MDN in a book. Uh, Mozilla Developer Network, best number one stop for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript information on the internet. And I learned through that. It was still IRL development resources that taught me how to build digitally. But once I got HTML and CSS uh, and JavaScript and PHP literate, it was easy for me to go through the online documentation for things like Drupal and for WordPress and get started that way. So it was interesting how there was this like very real world hurdle to get over. You know, had to get the connection because the connection wasn't a given. Uh, had to get the actual like the fuel the books to get started because the information wasn't easy to find online um but i didn't need to go to like college or anything like that in fact at the time i think you know there was this vibe of oh web pages it's not you know it's not programming that's that's like a document that you write and it's true you know html documents they it was a documentation format and that's what you can see in some of the uh some of the paradigms that libraries like React still work with on the web today. Really interesting background. I didn't, it's so cool that you started in like the real world in a way where like you approached programming with like the physical familiarity of a book, both because it is a resource that's more reliable due to the limited access to internet, but also the ability to have that as like a more logical starting point. I feel like something that's both over present and underdeveloped right now in like developer education is that first step. There are so many people that make content that's like how to start as a programmer, writing your first website, like the first steps, but it almost feels like they just drop you off right there at the end of that. And then you're back to where you were before, but with a little bit, I'm curious how you feel about then it sounded like you had a good experience going from that first book to the MDN docs and other things on the internet. Do you think that's changed for other developers now? And what do you think of the like getting started experience for new developers? So many of the new developers that I interview learn through YouTube videos, which is weird because that's the last place I would want to start. Um, I, I prefer to do like walkthrough tutorials. Oh, there's a video there. That's great. But videos are tough because they're hard to bookmark. You can't copy pasta uh, and the commands that people are using. I'm always fidgeting with, you know, play, pause, play, pause, play, pause. 
I'm not going to watch it through, remember it, and then replay everything in my head. I don't have a brain that works that way. I think some people do. I don't. Um, but this is the most popular way to get started today. You can't argue with numbers. I personally prefer tutorials, uh, guides, and interactive content um, so much. I remember the first time I started learning React. I, you know, I go and I heard this story so many times during years of research. I go, I, you know, sign up for one of these big deal, expensive courses on a training site. And I would spend like the first two hours installing libraries to build a very um, fragile tool chain. And if any of those libraries were new version now and it kind of broke that fragile tool chain, I would spend another half hour trying to go down that rabbit hole. And I'd be doing all of this just to get to the point where I could get to Hello World. And it was so demoralizing. I could never remember anything about React by the time I'd slogged my way through the first couple of features. I, uh, you know, I was so tired. It turns out that the, the principles of something like React are actually fairly straightforward. The problem is getting to the point where you can learn it. And often you'd find that it's easier to learn React when you're onboarding to a team and there's an existing superstructure that you're functioning in and you're just writing the markup there in JSX and you figure out, oh, this is how state is. You're not like, do I want to install X state? Why, why is X state, why is X state not compatible with this version of React? I don't, I don't, I don't know. And it, that is so much. It's the complexity of getting started programming is in many situations unnecessarily high. But remember how I just told you that HTML, CSS, JavaScript are built on top of a documentation paradigm? You know, you're just building really fancy PDFs. Uh, it was not designed for apps. It was not designed for interactivity. It was not designed to build games, although I would love to build games with it. Uh, this, is the, this is the quintessential problem. Developers love to solve problems. We build abstractions. You know, standards aren't going to give us the paradigm we want. We come up with that paradigm. We build on top of it. We just keep going forward. Nothing can start a person who is in the mood to create. I mean, nothing can stop a person who is creating. The problem with building layer and layer of abstractions is then the people who are coming up from behind you are like, what is this? How do I activate this? How do I do what you do? And you end up with slews of videos uh, teaching people just how to get to hello world, how to get over that hurdle, how to build something, you know, that could have been straightforward if you were starting with a fully developed platform like a mobile development, like a to-do list or something like that. But you have to like, now you get React, now you get State, now you get, and where do you want to host it? Oh my God. So many decisions, so many decisions. It's not like you unbundle a zip file on a PHP server and you go set some configurations somewhere and suddenly you have an interactive version of MySpace. It doesn't work that way anymore. But I, uh, I, I, am, I am going off on a tangent here a little bit, but I think that that can be one of the issues is, we have great power now, but we've built on, we've built many layers up from the rails because the rails were not providing what we needed. And the question is, do you like parachute people in and just say, well, don't worry about any of the things that this is built on. Here's how you get to hello world in an interactive sandbox in the browser. Or do you hold their hand in a long video showing them exactly how to set up a uh, visual studio, how to, uh, how, how to um, you know, get all their credentials on GitHub set up, how to make all of these decisions. Like, do you start at the end or do you start in the middle? And th those are two very different approaches to teaching, but they're both valid. You touched on so many interesting things there. There's three points I really want to dig in on. One of them I'm going to table for much later, which is games in the browser. I'm a really big nerd about React 3 Fiber and all the cool things to do with like 3D rendering and engines in web tech. We'll talk about that way later if you're still down, if we're not too deep in the education stuff. But there was two particular points on the journey here that were really interesting. One was the idea of decision making as almost like a hamper for learning, where if you have to make decisions, that can be a really big roadblock that keeps you from getting to the next step because you don't know if you've made the right decision yet. You don't have enough information to determine that and you don't know what that whole process or loop looks like and it's really easy to get stuck there. The other point that you made here that was really interesting was the idea of like a creator's going to create. 
is a big part of why I build creator tools and not developer tools. I think that there's a a fundamental level in like the art, art space of no one's doing that just for the money. Like you have to love the thing you're making enough to to be frank, hate yourself a little bit to push put all yourself into it. And in engineering, that definitely exists, but I don't feel like it's the default in quite the same way. But if you are one of those people that has something tech unlocks for you, like code gets you this thing you care about, you will create this thing, regardless of if the tech helps you. That is one of the best ways to become successful, especially early on. So those are like the two really interesting pieces I wanted to dig in on more, either one more interesting for you. Man, um, those are both really exciting. Which one are you more pulled toward? I'm not, which is why I asked. <laughs> The decision making things is so interesting. And that's something I definitely noticed in my time at Twitch in particular, but also now like running things at Ping. It's very apparent that good developers get stuck in decision making hell when they should be building or learning in other ways, like spending weeks trying to pick between Zustan, Jodi, Re Redux, MobX, and Nextate does not help you in your first three months of building web apps and it doesn't yeah and i've noticed that helping like even earlier devs that are entirely new to web tech like one of the superstar engineers at ping they were mostly doing like game engine dev in rust and zig and had never built anything on the web before joining us and they've been one of the most productive full stack engineers i've ever worked with by a lot and i think a lot of that is when they have examples around, they're really good at using those to identify and apply patterns to new problems. And like one of the craziest moments for me working with them was they've been building full stack features like admin panels for our product and stuff for three plus months. We sketched out a new feature together, spent like two hours diagramming it at all. At the end, they said, I feel so embarrassed asking this, but like it's a question I should know the answer to what's an endpoint? It just never yeah, come up with the way I... that they were building because what an endpoint was didn't matter when you understood how the parts interacted and were just applying the patterns. They didn't need to know the definitions of these words. We didn't write endpoint in our code a whole lot. But conceptually, those things that you can spend all this time learning don't matter when you're trying to build. Absolutely. Uh, and this is something that uh, I think actually bears mentioning. You mentioned dec decision fatigue, and decision fatigue is not the right, the right, it's not the thing that a, uh, a learner needs at that stage. They should be focusing all their energy on retaining and drilling content. Deciding things, like putting people at the very start and being like, now you're at the beginning, so you're going to have to slog your way forward and learn from scratch the same way I did, I think is pretty naive. Like We often tend to think, this worked for me, so it's going to work for everyone else. But maybe the way you learned actually sucked. You didn't realize it at the time because there weren't as many abstractions. But learning alone actually sucks. You don't learn the acronyms. You don't learn things like an endpoint. Or in my case, you don't learn how to read error cons uh, errors in the console. True story. I'd never pair coded with an engineer who worked with JavaScript and debugged it before in my life. When I was on the React Core team, I got the chance to do that. And I was just like, how do you know where the error is? He's like, there's a carrot right there. I was like, so there is. It was very pale. I did not know that that was there. Oh, okay. And all the other stuff below it's just bullshit I can ignore. Yeah, this is bullshit you can ignore. Oh, I would have tried to read through every single thing because some people's brains, a lot of us, uh, we, we tend to rabbit hole. Like, I have to pick a solution. I'm going to go research all the solutions and make the correct decision. Then I'll get to Hello World. Uh, how does the error console work? I will read the instruction manual for the error console until I understand every feature that is there and all the hot key. That's beside the point. It's kind of like learning to dance. You can learn from looking at a chart that shows feet positions and you can like watch videos and try to do it yourself. The other way to learn to dance is to join a dance or to have, you know, that would be like being dropped on a project and someone saying, here are some patterns, copy pasta your way to success. You'll know if it's working by running the tests. And honestly, that's really effective because you're seeing immediate results for putting knowledge into practice, which by the way, is one of the best predictors of uh, whether you'll retain knowledge or not, drills. You know, you learn quickly, you drill, 
you can stop. You don't have to keep cramming information into your head. You're not going to retain that. But it's putting things into practice that has in actual studies shown that people, this is the best way for people to learn. Uh, the other thing, you know, you want to learn to dance. Maybe there's not a huge dance going on. Find one person who knows how to dance and partner. I love pair coding. I do advent of code every year because it's like the best way to like, well, what data structure would you use? Oh, well, that's an interesting choice. Oh, I never would have thought of doing it that way. And how are you reading that error? <laughs> yeah, I uh, so have a, a huge approaches. thing here too. We are all huge fans of that cipher drifting. It's so much fun. Yeah, I'm addicted. I absolutely love it. We get really competitive. I am planning on making a big community thing this year and I'm hyped for it. Uh, one thing you touched on there, that's something I've been thinking a lot about because I'm I'm seeing it from a different angle as like a, a senior content creator. The idea of like the the things you don't learn if you don't see others who are doing it. Like there's a difference between like for me, the skateboard example, like learning to skateboard in a barn in the middle of nowhere and learning to skateboard with hundreds of other skaters. There's actually some benefits to the barn experience that like the person who invented the kickflip, like the person who realized you could jump on your board and also that you can jump and flip the board was a 10 year old kid in a barn in Florida learning to skate in, t in complete isolation, showed up at a skate contest, assuming everybody else had already figured this out. Of course they did. I figured it out in my garage and invented half of street skateboarding through the isolation. But for the 99.99% of people, that doesn't work. And there are very important things you're going to miss out on too if you're not surrounded with others. That said, what I've been seeing more of is people who recognize that they are having that like Ronnie Mullen barn experience and that they need things from the outside to figure out what they're missing and where they are to an extent. It's really hard to level yourself and understand where you're at in your growth and your development career without seeing others and how they're progressing too. A really interesting thing I've seen is people have taken advantage of me and my content as a resource in a very similar way to what I experienced pairing with newer engineers at Twitch, where they'll follow along with one of my live tutorials, ask questions in chat. If they watch after the fact, they'll clone the project, run into a problem and hit me up with questions about it. There is no better way to get my attention than to send me a GitHub repo using a bunch of my tech, a little message saying what's working, what you like about it, and a detailed, I'm having this problem though, I've tried these things, can you help? One of my favorite developers in the community, Code Stallion, shout out. He's a developer from South Africa that's been self-taught for a bit now. Fell in love with a stack that I use in one of my YouTube videos and actually made the best blog post on how to assemble these parts that exists out there right now because he had so many problems getting them to play nice that he wanted to make a better resource and used me both to as a resource to get through the hard parts there to level himself and understand where he was and then make more resources to help others too. And it was really cool to see all of those pieces of growth in that one interaction. And I think that that's the strength of video, in particular live video. People can use it to supplement not having peers to do that pairing with. Yeah, it's true. My only complaint is that videos fall out of date so rapidly. Any video from three years ago is practically useless today. Uh, you're just not going to see the same stack. You're going to have run into different kinds of bottlenecks and complications. And I, I got to tell you, having lived with like the cloud, uh, it's sort of like a black hole, any sort of technology that you need to teach people. It's a black hole and it collects shadows of things that have passed through it around its surface. Uh, so there's this, this glow, this, this trash field of, you know, you know, you've got that very juicy three month old content, slightly less attractive six month old content, year old content. And then you've got like the trash pile of three to five year old content just circulating. And algorithms do their best to help with that, but it can become problematic. Like you can find people making mistakes because they're following a resource that's very canonical, that's old and isn't being maintained anymore. And that can become a problem when you're teaching at scale um, because you know, you want to create that flywheel where people are teaching each other and they're creating resources. And this is why it's so important when you have a project or a product that you're working on that you invest in creating that canonical source of truth, your MDN, if you will, 
the place that people know is always up to date. The code always works when you copy and paste it. You know, like it is a trusted deep resource. And if you can create that, then the people who create the learning materials will always be able to put up a link and say, yeah, if you get stuck here, uh, you can find more documentation about how this works over here. And that empowers those teachers to know that they can kind of stand on the shoulders of this canonical core truth and teach people how to do something different with it, how to remix it, how to understand it in a new way. And that's really what it means to be working on developer education uh, for a library like React or on a, a product or a service like Stripe. It's to give people who are learning that, that safety net, that trust, that connection to the engineers who originally built the thing and sort of, well, I like to think of it as like a human API for copying and transferring that knowledge over into other people's brains, and then they can run with it from there. If you are in a situation where people are having to pick through your source code to teach each other through videos, that quickly becomes unsustainable and confusing for learners. They just want to know exactly what the people who built the thing are thinking and how it works. If they get stuck, they need to be able to look it up. And this content like resurfaces in all kinds of places. An API reference can end up getting piped into developer tools. Some people never look at documentation because the documentation is feeding directly into uh, directly into the tools they use every day. And that's as it should be. It's, it's about creating a canonical kind of API that reaches deep into the source code and the minds of the people who work on it and can port that information out to wherever a developer needs it at the time they need to learn it. I really like that framing. I think it's so important to have like that those core sources of truth. And I like the idea that documentation should and learning materials should stem from reliable sources of information that if linked to will always link to what works now. I think that is really important. I also think and this might be a slight tangent. The nature of react has almost amplified this problem what it doesn't exist because of the nature of how collaborative and how community focused react and the react development experience is. like when you're building an angular app you install angular when you're building a view app you install view and whatever their recommended view library is when you install react who knows what else is coming with it that's not a flaw in react i actually think it's one of the biggest strengths in it but with that comes a level of like branched documentation where there are packages that Im in, or that import from packages that import from packages that import from an old React version, and you might not know where you are there. And if something's out of date, finding the right document in the thing you're using that links to the thing it's using, that links to the thing it's using, like that, the the chain from the source of truth doesn't feel like it gets honored a lot. I personally run into this using a framework that I love called TRPC that is built heavily on top of React Query for the React implementation, and developers in my community often run into the problem of I don't know which of these two docs to go to well which of these three even when I'm running into this problem do I go to the trpc documentation for the full stack implementation do I go to the react query documentation for how I'm actually using that in react or do I go to the react documentation directly and that confusion really sucks it does and this is I mean it's both the open source dream which was you know Look, you can install a stack that's being dictated to you by a corporation, a bunch of opinionated architects somewhere, who knows? Or, or you can take just what you need and build a stack that perfectly solves your problem in a way that you feel strongly about. Uh, that is a nightmare for a learner, but it can actually be really powerful for somebody who's building a solution and knows what they want and they need. It's great for mid-level, terrible for beginner. I think what was interesting with React is that you're seeing so many people like you have to learn React because so many opinionated pipelines have been built with React. So many, you know, corporate infrastructures is like they're using a bunch of homebrew and React and you can't learn about all the things surrounding React from the React documentation. And that is something that is beyond the scope of a open source documentation product uh, project to solve for. It would be great if you know, you could solve, you know, they explain the intricacies of implementing every routing library with React in one place. 
but that would require coordinating with like n project owners and if you've ever tried to coordinate an open source yeah so it, it it is a mixed bag but on the other hand you know it also means that things move quickly and the community has been able to evolve and iterate solutions faster than a core development team could so i don't know you just, you have to get nimble at learning. And with the documentation project at React, which you can go check out at beta.reactjs.org, it's the best way to learn React today. And I mean, not that I'm, not that I uh, am biased in any way, but uh, I actually added a chat docs, command in Twitch chat, exclamation point React, and it'll link straight to the React docs. Also added exclamation point Rachel. So you can go give them a follow over on Twitter. Awesome socks, but yeah, uh, learning, Learning uh, React should uh, not require having to learn everything around React. And these docs just focus on teaching React in collaborative, uh, interactive commute, uh, interactive examples, which I really love. Our friends at Code Sandbox helped out with those. And it, it tries to be very agnostic. Uh, I know a lot of people want best practices when they're reading documentation, but the problem with an unopinion li unopinionated library is like the only best practices we get for you is like, don't mutate state. We got a function for that, use it. So uh, yeah, sometimes you have to make the documentation simple and modular and, and trust that library developers will invest the same amount of resources in their learning materials that you have. Yeah, absolutely. It's I really like how you're thinking about this on like the React side, where this is one of the strengths of React. It is a modular platform where people are going to build their own stacks with it. And as such, the React documentation strength isn't going to be the opinions it prescribes. It's going to be the simplicity that it, in how it communicates what it does and the ability for people to understand that and use it as a like a launching pad to take their own next steps and i think it does a great job with that like one of the simple examples was the like i think it was the react for production page that's like how do you actually ship your react app once you've like started building it and i really liked how it called out the different paths to deploy it's like we're not building these we're not endorsing these but these are the things the community is recommending now you can learn more about them in these places it was such a nice acknowledgement of here is what we're doing, here is what we're not, so that you as the developer have a clear point to take off in a way. It's really challenging to put those pieces together, especially with a what they call a stadium project like React, because anytime we say, oh, well, if you're looking for a router, um, you know, like, like here are some routing solutions, which one are you gonna do? Put up the most popular one well that kind of puts downward pressure on any new solutions because now this is the canonically recommended by react on the react page uh one of 50 router solutions i uh, top three you still have the same problem with the bottom 47 uh and and you end up in this kingmaker position where you want to tell people like use your own judgment you know you decide but people sometimes come in and they really want to just be told like no just i i want to get started young today if they're not already working in someone's established chain or or, or framework and i think that's where things like next.js really come in and become useful they are more opinionated they do you know gatsby for uh, in its right as well uh, they come in, they're more opinionated, they have, you know, bolted in support for, you know, popular solutions, and they can, you know, they can say, this is, this is the library we use, this is the one we coordinate with, we have a product manager who goes and works with that team, and we have a roadmap, uh, trust the system. And in that situation, I think this is sort of like how we're seeing the React community evolve and grow is this is sort of that end game is where React is just a library and there are different service providers. You know, Expo over in React Native has a very opinionated way about how you build with React Native. And if you don't have strong opinions of your own, you should probably trust those people. Yep, I couldn't agree more. My take with this has always been, if you don't have the opinions yourself, go with somebody else's until you run into the problems with them. Like. You're, this is going to happen in this community. Like I, at this point, have very strong opinions about how we should build web applications, and I make a lot of content about what that looks like. 
a lot of you guys aren't going to be building web applications and you're going to try and use the stack for it and you're going to run into problems and it's going to be frustrating and you're going to look at something like remix or you're going to look at something like astro or quick or quick or marco and say this makes a lot more sense than what theo's talking about and you'll be right it makes way more sense than what i'm talking about for you and one of the best ways to learn that is to run into where it doesn't work and i think that what the react docs are doing really well here by acknowledging what they are and what react's role is is they get you going fast enough to run into those things yourself really quick and i genuinely love that about it like react's new documentation gets you to the point where you can do damage so quickly and that's really exciting for me what excites me is when I hear about team leads onboarding new people and saying, yep, my my new my new employee was running into this problem. And I just deep link them to the part of the documentation that explained how to lift state up, uh, you know, how to use context, etc. I that is what we're solving for. You shouldn't have to go down a rabbit hole of misleading YouTube inform, uh, informationals uh, that are promoting someone's personal brand that may or may not explain how context work because we never explained it well in the first place. It's like, now we've explained it well. No excuse. Everyone go teach the truth. Yep. I, it's so nice. I've been pushing for most new hires to go through the whole new beta react site. I just think like, it doesn't really nice. matter what level of developer you are. If you're a more junior developer, this will be huge to get you kickstarted. If you're like, mid senior developer this will help you like fill out holes in your knowledge and like build up a better vocabulary to talk about the thing you use all the time and if you're like principal level it's a gold standard example of how to educate other developers from those other places and level them as quick as you can and i think that as such is one of those rare resources in programming where even if you're like a native game developer there's a lot of reason to read through the new react docs because there's so much to learn about how to how to teach and how to get people excited to learn. Ah, high praise. Thank you so much. I hope everyone will go check them out at beta.reactjs.org. Please do if you haven't yet. I'm curious, like, as you guys were working on it, what other communities and resources did, did you look to to learn lessons from and like really like take advantage of as you took the beta react docs to the new or to this new level? You know, it's interesting. Everybody asks us that. And yeah, you know, I brought my MDN background from Mozilla Developer Network, which is, you know, very granular, you know, assume nothing about uh, what people might know about an API. Hooks were really difficult to, to document in the traditional MDN way, though, because they are functional. And if you document functional um, paradigms using, you know, the traditional, like, and here's a link to a page that lists the arguments. And if you click on one of those arguments, it takes you to another page, which explains the different forms that it takes. It really separates the thing that you're doing from the impact that you want to have. And we had to rethink how we were going to do, you know, explain the APIs in the API documentation. I actually ended up pulling from my cartooning background to suggest um, you know, that we were, we do interactive uh, code diagrams that sort of point out what the code is doing right there. It was unconventional. Uh, we hadn't seen documentation like that before, but it was very, very effective uh, for explaining, like, you know, what, what is the argument, the optional argument that you pass in the use effect? What's it do? What is that? Uh, so we also wanted to, you know, go look at Stripe. Everyone's like, Stripe stocks are incredible. They got this great scrolly telling features. Uh, we worked on a scrolly telly feature for a while. It turned out that it didn't actually help people. It was just sort of like walking them through the code and explaining it to them. But what we really found was clicking with the people we were user testing with was the interactive sandboxes. You know, this is something that's felt had to begin with. And we were like, yeah, we don't want to block people from learning stuff by making them click through a bunch of, you know, sandboxes though. We just want to put them there. So that if people are scrolling around, they can interact with them or not. And I kid you not, the first couple of people that we, you know, the first batch of people that we tested this feature with were so not used to being able to interact with any code on the page that they wouldn't click or interact with the, the sandboxes at all. They thought they were photographs of code, uh, that they were screenshots. This is this is how much Medium has ruined the developer education experience. 
And so we had to make them look more like a code editor. You know, bless San Code Sandbox's heart for for you know taking all this feedback and acting on it. But you know, doing little numbers turned out that just doing things like changing the cursor when people would hover over it, adding numbers down the side, that, that was all it took. They didn't need like big buttons saying, you can interact with me. People don't read, they look. And if the sandbox reacts like a code editor, they'll interact with it like a code editor. So a few quick tweaks and suddenly people were like, ah, is this, no, it's not a code editor on the page, is it? Hold on a moment. And then they click in and they start working with it. So I'd love to tell you that we took a lot of inspiration from a lot of pre-existing work, but it was more like we were finding what was working for the users, and then we were acting on that. And we had to we had to invent some new modalities, especially around the API documentation, because it just hadn't been done before. There's so much really inspiring documentation out there. I wish we could have just picked up and run with more of what people had already done. It would have it would have made the development time for the documentation a lot faster. <laughs> There were so many really cool, interesting bits in there. One that I feel like I haven't heard much talk about just in general. I'd love to hear what the process was like for getting feedback on this with de our developers. Like obviously right when the new beta react site, like originally dropped, you guys had tons of open feedback channels, but was there a feedback process before then? How'd you try things like that story timeline solution? Like what did the early feedback process look like as you tried to test out these new opportunities? Well, honestly, I used to do UX uh, design way back at the beginning of my career before I realized how much more you could make as an engineer. Um, I was a cartoonist and people often saw the art that I did. They did not see that I could actually like install PHP on a server. So I did not know these things. I'd ha I had no mentors. This was, this was like the naughties, you know, like that was, we did not learn from each other on YouTube and have conversations on Twitter about mentorship and pay raises. Uh, but this was back then. Okay, processes for feedback. Yeah, so anyway, uh, what we did was user interviews. I honestly believe the best way to learn how to do something is to validate through actual humans. I've been in many a meeting where, um, you know, designers and engineers together would sit down and be like, you know, like, like to the sandbox thing, maybe we should put a big button on it that says, you can interact with this code. And then people will click on the button interact with the code. Only problem is, you know, UX books from the Naughties 101, people look, they don't read. You can't really, like, you can talk about it, you can argue about it, you can come up with all these different ideas and mock-ups in private, or you can just go and say, hey, this is, like, what are you going to do on this page? And just watch the person and follow along and not lead them, not be like, does this look like a code editor to you? Does this look interactive? Would you interact with this? No, just, just, just watch them. People will do things. You learn a lot from just watching and listening to people. You got two eyes, two ears, one mouth. So you know what to do. Uh, and so user interviews, uh, user uh, studies, that's basically it. And running surveys really helped. You know, from these interviews, you can form like a couple of, hmm, I think that what people are looking for is this. Let's ask in a survey, uh, how many people are looking for X, Y, and Z? Oh, turns out people were looking for that. Good, it's validated, move on. Uh, so basically really old school, hands on, you, you know, like I think mostly product managers do this now, uh, but like product managers and UX, UX researchers, you know, go out, talk to people, see how they're using and learning things. My background in training was really useful. Uh, Dan Abramov has a huge background in you know, thinking about and teaching uh, React and JavaScript concepts as well. And so that plus real live users, we were able to iterate over the site's design and content a lot so that when it dropped, the feedback we got was mostly stuff we were expecting. Like we realized that those were acceptable to an MVP. I, that was so interesting. I, I got a lot of my stance on user testing and like getting early user feedback from the game world. I'm lucky enough to have play tested a handful of games. I actually got to play test the DLC for my favorite game of all time, Outer Wilds, shout out Mobius, love them to death. I was the first person to beat the DLC over a year before it dropped and I had to not say a word. It was incredibly challenging, but one of the coolest experiences I ever had because like this is a play test with a studio that had just like won a BAFTA for their game and was like pretty legit at that point. And the people like running the playtest were the lead developer and the studio director, just those two in a discord with me. 
and the uh, it was so That's cool how, how they let uh, like they let me screw up and you could feel them feeling the pain of watching me struggle through things but they would hold themselves back until there was a point where they could like get something themselves from it and they would jump in to like ask questions rather than lead and i feel like even in my experience doing user interviews with like product people before there was a lot more leading than there was in that particular game uh test and since then i've always felt much more in the direction of what you were describing here of you just gotta watch ask questions and let them struggle because you're not going to be there for every user you know you could say the same thing about managing too like you can tell people what to do you can create i feel you on this i remember back when i used to make comics i used to take my comics uh because after you i would write them i would draw them i would ink them i would color them i would put them and letter them and put them on the line. By the time I got to the end of my pipeline, I was like, is this, is this funny? So I would often in the early stages, I would show, share the thumbnails and the script with people. And I'd have to be like, is this funny? I need, does this, is this coherent? Cause I have workshopped this so many times by now. And sometimes, you know, I get some really good feedback and I could make changes at the last minute before publishing, but the audience is your best place to go to. I've worked at some really big corporate places. Like, I'm doing the fang thing. I've worked at Microsoft. I've worked at Meta. I'm at Amazon. I've worked at Booking, uh, which is not fang. It's actually over there in uh, in Amsterdam, but it's like one of the big players in Europe. Yeah. And I often feel like the bigger and then more hierarchical the structure gets, the harder it is to have that connection with the user. Like, oh, no, no, no. There's a process before you can share anything with anyone. There's you got to sign this NDA. You got to like schedule time. It has to be sourced through an appropriate person and they need releases. If you're going to, it, it just keeps going. And after a while you, you run the risk of your whole user research team being more of a process team than being able to sit back and be like, uh-huh. Well, what are you doing now? That's cool. Yeah. It's like an interview, like a good tech interview is a lot of like, well, here's a problem. What are you going to do with it, buddy? And just, how are you going to react in the situation? And that can tell a person a lot about how that person is thinking, what they're feeling, how they react when they get struck, when they struggle. If somebody rage quits, people are way more patient with react, for instance, than other things, because they have to learn react. React is the ticket to six figure salary. You have to learn it. It's your job. And people are very patient. They are not patient with other libraries. They're not patient with other products. They rage quit a lot faster. And you know, you just won't know until you're working with somebody what their response is gonna be and where the, the, the bottlenecks and, and things are in your process. You just have to go talk to real people and be real with them. And that can be increasingly difficult to do as companies get bigger. Crazy how this is like one of the most common themes of this show, simply cause like, for those that don't know, I run a company, Ping, Ping Labs, ping.gg, I'll go up there. We do Y Combinator and they have like two themes, like two messages they they hammer into your head constantly. Talk to users and build something people want. That's like the core of all of their messaging. And it's really cool how that is where the best things are made everywhere, period. It's the best documentation comes from people who obsess over talking to the users, watching how they use the docs and improving that way. The best tools come from companies that built things they needed themselves and are super close with those users and building with them every day. The reason something like React is so successful is people like you, people like Dan, the people like Seb, the whole community around React being as accessible and interactive as they were, we got to level up really hard, really quick. And I think a lot of those things are just being there so the people who have the problems can explain them to you and you're accessible enough to hear them and then solve them. And that's where real, like, that's where you go from something that works to something that's great. I agree. It's that human connection. You can't distill it into analytics. You can't um, bottle it and package it and, you know, resell it over and over as a template. It's if you want to innovate, 
if you want to make something new and special, you have to start with people and try to solve their problems. Absolutely. I didn't really think about how important that was even in documentation. Like, I feel like documentation is often treated as like a task, like a thing someone has to go do and be done with rather than a story and a project kind of how you've taken it on. Like this is a this is a, a thing that we are building and growing and like almost creating a system around rather than a task I have to go complete, like go fill out the API doc for this new hook. It's much deeper than that. And as such, the expectations of building any other product or project of like working with your users, going through betas, like finding the right people to collaborate with and all of the other things that make building a project more than just writing the code. I feel like documentation is often treated like the task no one wants to do. It's just the thing someone has to go fill out. And you've fully inverted that with this process. You know, it's funny. I work with some people who are really passionate about documentation. I think a lot of people want to put documentation first. They want to teach others. They want to share that knowledge. But it's hard to know how. It's not easy. Um, you can automatically generate documentation from your code, but if you're not good at communicating, what do you put there? We focus so hard on building these, de de these dedicated technical skills. We lose the soft human side of our personality. And that means, you know, if you can't communicate, you lose a lot of what it means to be human. And documentation is hard because it requires you to be really, really human and to cast aside all your assumptions and all the things that you lean on, all your personal crutches and the framework that holds you upright every day, and to reach out to another person's mind as though you are both fresh and new to this world. And that's very, very difficult. I really like that framing. It, I hadn't thought of it that way before. The documentation is the translation layer between the tech and the human. It's the thing that does the communication for both sides in a way. And it's when you think of it that way, like obviously the docs seem to be as human as possible, but I don't think I've ever thought that way before. You know, it's not just the docs. I mentioned how a lot of APIs to VS code are generated from the same things that back documentation. It's actually that layer of, I mean, I wanna like strip aside our definition of documentation here because documentation, like it's becoming an increasingly outmoded reference. Uh, point for teaching people like yeah you need a place where people can look up the definitions of things but people do that in their developer tools now people are it's likely to start typing something in vs code and use autocomplete and then they might not know wait what what is the type for this and they hover over it and you know it, it it tells them what it is and that content usually comes from the same place that the documentation comes from there is this core uh, bundle of information that as developers, as engineers of things that people will use, we have to really think carefully about how we make it accessible to as many people as possible and how we're communicating the things that we put out into this world. Uh, if you can do that well, and you truly have something revolutionary, you can change the face of the world. But if you make something that really could change the world, but you're terrible at communicating it, it you know, does a tree falling in a forest with no one around really make a sound? I've watched many technically great solutions or technically important ideas fall short because they're not communicated in the way that humans can understand. I mean, just look at some of the problems facing us environmentally on this planet. Um, if these issues were communicated better and had less noise and interference from outside sources, maybe we as people would understand our situation and know what to do about it. Absolutely. There is so much noise to filter through and it's incredibly difficult even for a newer developer. One thing I want to push there, the idea of the like something that's technically great, but the communication isn't there and it doesn't have the revolutionary impact it could otherwise. I think I've even seen the opposite where something technically wasn't there, but the communication ability was. And through that, they were able to get it there technically and get to that revolutionary point. Like if you have the communication, you can power through the other parts that are missing. So I'm going to bring this up, but Loveless and Babbage, we could have had the computer revolution like a hundred years earlier than we did. 
But um, Babbage was this guy working on the thinking machine. Back, it was very steampunk, just like a computer built with nothing but tiny little Swiss gears. And uh, Ada Lovelace was like his interpreter who wrote a lot of things. But this guy had no social skills. He just kept pissing off the people who were funding the project. And at one point, she could not repair the damage he had done to their chief governmental financier. And he died having never completed the project. You see, it, the, the British government couldn't look at his work and appreciate it. So he was almost entirely relying on Ada being the person who could communicate its value, communicate his, his genius. She was a genius in her own right. She could actually communicate that shit to people who did not care and saw him as being a finicky little nerd working on something. I don't know what it would do. And she's like, no, it will change the world. You cannot starve this man's genius. And it, it's sad because here's a situation where communication just, you know, it held humanity back for a hundred years, a hundred years. Do you know what kind of a world we'd live in right now? If that had gone through, do you know? I don't we would think have anyone hit could. it before we hit our fossil fuel cap. Like, holy crap, it would change yes. things. Oh. Then think of it in terms of like against global warming, how impactful that could have been. Yeah, that would have been, damn. Jeez. It's just like we would have achieved a lot of scaling technology earlier or, you know, like change the face of empires. It would be a complete alternate universe. Who knows what would have happened? We would have had more resources to do the uh, technological advances we're pulling off earlier. So um, who knows? We're, we're running with what we've got. These sort of things happen throughout history. You know, the antisicarium machine that was dug up uh, from back in the ancient era, it never took off either. So who knows? But speaking of technologically met solutions taking off and the really great ones getting lost, well, you can look at like Nikola Tesla as an example of someone who was making technologically brilliant things but didn't have the marketing suave uh, as his greatest competitor, uh, Edison. And we ended up with a lot of less than ideal solutions because Edison was just a better salesman and was better you know, going out and doing road shows and talking to people and convincing them of the, the greatness of the thing that he was working on. And you can kind of see that in some of our solutions. Like I loved less CSS and SAS CSS. SAS was the technically superior solution. You could do more, solve more problems. But less, you know, had a nicely designed marketing site. It was made by the design community and some leadership there. So it really spoke to those sensibilities. And, you know, SAS had a long way to go to make up for that. And it did. It did eventually, it did eventually become the tool of choice. And now we don't even talk about either of them anymore, but that did happen. Yeah, it's crazy how much like communication. Like the thing that my mind immediately went to when you mentioned like Nikola Tesla was how that name even has now been commandeered by somebody who's mostly a marketer. And it's crazy how like Nikola never was able to <laughs> properly market his name and someone else was now like centuries later. But that's how important those things are. And I think a lot of like the people who are remembered in history, even the most like technical people we think of, like the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs of the world, they were communicators first and foremost. They varied in their technicality, but all of them were incredibly strong communicators. And one of my personal favorites, Tim Sweeney at Epic, he's a CEO that I've always been really inspired by. He's the TLDR of what I love about him is he's centered the business around game developers in anything that makes game developers more successful makes Epic more successful. So things they can do to invest in game developers long term, like help fund a studio that's using Unity so they don't go out of business, even if they never use an Epic tool for for the next dozen plus games they make and they go out of business, the good faith they've built and keeping those developers in game development means that they're more likely to go to another studio and might use Unreal in the future and might make Epic more money long term. That's why they were willing to kill Fortnite on iOS to possibly increase the cut of revenue that game developers make on iPhones. They take these huge like risks because long term the business is centered around fulfilling that need. And I think he understands that because he's so deep in the communication with these game developers. He talks to studios and talks to everyday devs constantly and tries to live that experience still, even though he's a big CEO of the Fortnite company. He's still down in the trenches talking about, like he's very technical and goes on rants about how JSON's the wrong standard for game development. Really cool technical discussion. 
because he's having these conversations and it's cool how he might look like the most technical CEO ever to others outside. But the reason he's so technical is that's the need of his user and his communication led him to the technical side in a way. Yeah. I think it's great to see leaders that do take that customer centric approach um, and do invest in their communities, not as a source of income, but as an ecosystem that has to be cultivated and various flywheels that may not be running right now, but they can act as a store of power that can keep the community going through hard times later. Absolutely. Speaking of hard times, growth, and our favorite word, enough, I want to pivot into this fun conversation. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, I think so. This will be an interesting one. This was <laughs> for context for everyone else. Rachel and I have had some very philosophical DM conversations around like growth, leadership, impact, diversity, and all these things. And one topic we kept getting back to was this idea of enough. Like what is, what does enough mean to you in almost any of these things? So to start to go with what we've been talking about this whole time, like growth and developer success, what does enough mean for a developer in their work? And how do you think about this yourself? I think first we got to back it up and talk about the concept of enough. Uh, Let's do because it. it means different things to different people in different situations. And there are frameworks like OKRs and KPIs that are designed to measure impact. But really what you're measuring is, is it enough? Was this effort enough to get the result uh, that we were looking for? And I was raised on a farm. So I have all kinds of not enoughs in my life. You know, not enough uh, connection to other people because it was a very lonely and isolated upbringing. Um, not enough money. I was very poor. Uh, not enough time in the life that I have because there's so much that I wanted to do. And as I continue to level up in my life, I am able to do more things. But no matter how many things that I do, it's never enough. I never feel like I can stop. And I meet a lot of people, uh, young people, even old people, people from all kinds of backgrounds. And they don't always know what enough is. We live in a culture in the United States that's like, you want to get rich, you want to get famous. What's famous enough? You know, like, is it enough to be an award-winning cartoonist in a comic book uh, industry? Or do you want to be like the award-winning director of a movie based on your comics? You know, like, hang on a moment. Movies are a very small industry. What if you want an award-winning game based on your stories that you're telling? There you go. Is that enough? Or do you need to be like Elon Musk? Is being Elon Musk enough? Uh, and if you don't know what enough is to you, you end up on a hedonic treadmill where you're always chasing enough and you can chase yourself to exhaustion, chase yourself to burnout, ruin yourself, ruin your life because you did not know when to quit. You did not know this is enough. This is good for me. I'm going to go. You can end up in a dead end job. You can end up with a skill set you don't love anymore if you don't know when to call it. Uh, what do you think, Theo? How do you know when to call things in your life? Enough to yeah. you. This is why this was such an interesting conversation for me. I didn't really ever think in terms of enough before. I would occasionally think in terms of not enough when something wasn't meeting like my goals or expectations. But for me, I think in terms of growth and opportunity more than like specific points. Like I'm a, to an extent, I'm always thinking in the future of where can I be and how can I get there? Not even in the sense that it's like, I constantly want to be getting closer to that, like super Elon Musk figure or whatever, but in, I want to feel like I'm making progress in some way and it can be different things. Like if I'm not getting a lot done at work, enough goes from what I'm contributing at the office to my skateboard and I'll just go skateboard for six hours straight and learn a new trick or do something no one's ever done before. And that power is enough for me more often than not. 
And I guess for me, enough is the satisfaction of feeling like I did something meaningful. And what meaningful is changes regularly for me. But enough is a, a satisfaction rather than a level for me, which is why this was so interesting. And I find that interesting. I've seen so many people I know, and I've been this person, like, all right, I have a friend, and they were happy at their job. They were feeling like they were on their, their march to whatever. They, they were like, yeah, my manager supports me. I feel like they're developing me. I might have reports. You know, I'm on that, that career path here. I'm on the thing that makes me happy. And then a recruiter slides into their emails and offers them a role that aligns more with their personal value, does nothing else to get them further in the direction of that career ladder goal. But suddenly their whole world was thrown up in, in the air because what if that's enough? Aren't I supposed to be living towards my values? Um, and yeah, I've had similar things happen with other people where they're, they were trucking along uh, and they, they realized that they wanted to make a little bit more money to support their family. And then they had to choose between different opportunities of vastly differing incomes. And they couldn't tell which was enough. Do I want the extra money for my family? Is that enough? Or do I want the thing that aligns with my passions? Is that enough? And they cannot weigh because they never sat down and defined what their price was. You know, what is the bar that I am trying to meet? And if you don't have those things, if you don't know you know, like, yeah, I'm not going to take less than $8 per chicken auction house thinking, um, you know, like this is the price that I came in wanting and you're going to give it to me or I'm leaving with these birds. If you don't have that price, you can end up accepting anything. You can end up not being able to resolve disputes between two people who both want your birds and they're offering you different lots. Uh, without that framework, you can just end up on bended knee to other people and their whims and not being in charge of your life and your decisions but rather letting other people make those decisions for you and force your hand. This is really interesting because up until the auction house, I didn't feel like this applied to me. And then I realized I don't know the dollar amount I would sell my company for right now. I have no idea what that is at all. And it is like, it's an unimaginably high number, but if that was to be put in front of me, I don't know what my framework to saying yes would be. I feel like I would say no on the face of it. And that's not great because mm, that means I don't have. Logical, that's emotional. Yeah. But this is that's why I did this. Like I could have kept my 350K or whatever a year job at Amazon Twitch and been fine there and kept doing that for a while. Doing that for as long as I did is what gave me the safety net to take the crazy risk of quitting my job and starting a company. But enough stopped mattering at that point in a lot of ways because enough wasn't enough. I was killing it at Twitch. I had a great salary, pretty good career trajectory, a lot of like awesome people behind me, but it didn't feel like enough. And I couldn't build a framework that made it enough. I'd actually set a goal for myself uh, when I was younger, like about a year or so after joining Twitch, I saw how quickly I was growing and I set myself like a specific goal of, the day I turn 25, if I don't have a promo doc in for my senior promo or I'm not senior already, I leave. And rather than quitting, I ended up switching teams when that happened with the promise that this team was going to very quickly get me leveled up. And they just didn't entirely dropped it. It was a false promise. And one of the few like career regrets I have was not holding myself to that one bar, which is hitting this at 25 as long as I'm continuing like my current growth is totally reasonable. That would be enough for what I'm putting in here. And when that wasn't met, I didn't hold myself to that. So the one time I did set one of these bars, I didn't meet it. Well, we should also talk about moving the goalposts on yourself because this is something I actually did. Um, what is enough changes throughout your time? When I was in London, I you know wrote down a number and I was like, this is what it would take for me to move back to the United States. Well, then I ended up meeting a very nice person in London and there was a pandemic and that number went up because suddenly I liked being in London a lot more than I liked the idea of returning to the United States. And I remember looking back on one of these because I actually would write them down to hold myself accountable. And I remember being like, wow, I really moved the goalposts around on myself over, 
over this period of time. And that's not bad. I think you were doing a smart thing. You were pivoting, you know, you, you had wanted that thing and you weren't holding yourself to a previous standard. You have to revisit your goalposts. You have to be like, does this still apply? And you made a good bet. There's a great book called Thinking in Bets, uh, which I highly recommend just to think in terms of bets. Like if I take this opportunity, how likely is it that I'm going to stay for another three years and get promoted? And if you're like, oh, it's 80% likely, you know, like I do like it here. I just need more opportunity. Um, yeah, I'll give it. And then you commit to a time frame, one year. If you don't get, you don't see any movement on that, move on. You experiment. You did an experiment, didn't work out. In the greater scheme of your life, that extra year is probably not a big deal. Uh, you're still on the entrepreneurial path. I guarantee you, if I looked into my two year peek around the corner crystal ball, uh, like your, your end game in your life isn't substantially different for having invested a little bit of extra time on that one year. Um, it's more like when you do things like bet on a relationship for 10 years and pass on opportunities. It's the bets you don't take uh, over long periods of time that add up and can take you further away from what is enough. Uh, financial security is enough for a lot of people, but very few people actually sit down to define what financial security looks like in a dollar amount for them. You just know, like, I always need more. There's never enough. I, my retirement account is low. It's, it'll never be high enough. Like, okay, seriously, what's the bare minimum you need to be happy year to year when you're an old person? Like, oh, I can't predict it. You can predict some of it. You know, your, your expectations might change, but you can look at what you're renting now, you can adjust for inflation, and you can be like, I'm going to assume I'm going to have these many expenses per year. I'm probably going to be retired for 30 years. I'll do the math. They're calculators. All right. How do I get that amount in these amount of years? All right. You backpedal from that. You do a little math around what you can put into your 401k. Suddenly you're looking at a salary number for the kind of end of life that you want. You're looking at a number that you need to make every year or how much you need to sell something for. And suddenly you can kind of start seeing the bets you can and cannot make. Like, well, I really love the idea that you have at your startup uh, that, you know, saves baby birds and returns them to the wild. However, I know that if I invest my lifespan into this, my anxiety levels are going to keep increasing because this does not get me closer to what is enough. When you have those numbers and you can quantify things, that really changes the table. Uh, it turns the table around when you're negotiating contracts for sales, when you're picking where you're going to live when you're figuring out what kinds of investments you're going to make in the things that you're building. And it's a good thing because you, you're never in full control of your life. Like, let's be honest, like the pandemic is a great example of here's something nobody could control and it's just going to inflict change on you. And there's nothing you can do about it, but respond. That's kind of glorious, but also terrifying for people who like to feel in control, which most humans do. It's a part of what makes us human. We like to control things. Uh, ourselves, other people, you know, society, uh, that's what we do. But if you can get to that number, um, there's a great book, How to Think About Money from the School of Life, which will walk you through exercises where you calculate, like, here's how much, how long I could live for if I stopped earning any money tomorrow. Here's how long I could go before I absolutely had to go check into a poorhouse. And you might surprise yourself, like, how long could you really survive. And it can put your fears into perspective, your fears of losing control, the wild unknown that could meet you if you just aren't enough at any point, if you don't invest in all the right skills, you don't take the right opportunities, you know, and you can start plotting out like, and this is how much I'd need to make to have uh, an ideal life, but here's how much I could actually make and be okay. And here's how much I'd love to make if I could be, you know, like all the things I want in the world. And when you see those different numbers lining up, suddenly becoming the most famous or most wealthy person in the world, you suddenly go, actually, I might prefer to just hit this number instead of just keep going to infinity. Uh, hit this number and then spend that time with my family or and move off grid and live on a tropical island. And then you're thinking reasonably. Now you're really in the driver's seat because you're starting to make predictions and bets about outcomes instead of letting your fears drive. People in the chat are already buying the book. So very excited. I to, hope they like it. 
yeah, I'm excited for them and I will definitely get somebody to give me a summary because I do not have the time to read a book right now. But this is very interesting and it's weird how much my brain is like pushing back on all of this. And to be frank, I don't think it applies to me where I am right now due to decisions I've made consciously. But like, I'm trying to find the right way to, to frame this because I know there's a lot of other entrepreneurs in the community that are copying what I'm doing and it might not be the right thing for them. And this is a really good opportunity for them to think what what is enough for them. Because what I realized for me is money wasn't enough. I was making crazy money and I could be making crazy more without much effort. I could start phoning it in and I even tried. There was a point at Twitch where I was like, okay, I can't do this. I'm not having the impact I should be. There's too much red tape. There's not enough opportunity for me to help the people I want to help here. I'm going to phone it in and work on some things on the side. I couldn't do it. I, I was physically incapable of like going to the meetings and just sitting there muted and smiling as people made terrible recommendations and built the wrong thing that would make the experience worse for our users. I didn't it wasn't enough and no amount of money would have made that enough for me. And what I realized was enough was the feeling of constantly helping the people I, I cared about and Twitch had not provided that for me. And I didn't see any way a company could. And for me, the entrepreneur journey is not like how big or successful can I be? Even like this stream right now, I'm doing all of this. I run this channel. I have guests like you on, so I can better understand the creator experience so I can make the content and the production of that content better for everyone on the internet. Like the future, Web3 isn't technology. The, the true third web is video content and interactivity. And I care so much about that and making it a better experience that nothing else was going to be enough. And as such, I threw away what was quickly on its way to a half million a year salary to eat ramen and build fun web tech. And I think that's something that people think they want, but they don't know if they do. And they might even convince themselves they want it when they don't. But for me, it was hard to not to not do this. I didn't want, want to do this. I got to an extent bullied into it. Ping was a side project and it was coworkers from Twitch and friends and people I was close with pushing me to do this because they saw that I wanted it more than I even did. And I think it's easy to, on both sides, convince yourself you want to be an entrepreneur when you really want to be content. And it's also easy to fall in the trap the other way after going to university and being told all about the like expectation of like, go get your fang job, grind there for a decade, go get your next fang job, grab, grind there for five years and then retire. Like, when that's pushed as hard as it is, it's easy to not notice it's not enough for you and that the satisfaction you're yeah, looking for could be that baby bird startup. I, I was just going to say, I never knew that you could get fang jobs. I remember the moment I found out you can make six figure jobs. I was like, wait, what? Where? Well, no one told me this. I did some entrepreneurial stuff back in the day and I hear you, you know, and I think this gets back to bets. There's times in your life that are really good for making bets, usually when you're younger, because you got Time is the one commodity ain't nobody selling. And you can invest your personal time however you want. And maybe, like, remember the people who, you know, made it big, who sculpted the fabric of society that we have today were people who took big bets young. You know, like um, the, the Google founders, these, these were bets that were made young. They didn't graduate from college and were like, I think I'll get a stable job. I mean, maybe there was some thinking about that. But there's also windows of that opportunity, like right after a really amazing new technological keystone has been invented. Like people who start that journey at that time, who were young then, are going to really succeed more in changing the face of, of humanity than people who start when, you know, we're going through a bit of a, a plateau in terms of innovation. Yeah, you're just you're you're doing fit and polish there for the human experience. Uh, so. I hear you. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with making those bets. When I was uh, younger, before I knew what you could get paid at big companies, I didn't like working at startups. I worked at a couple. I 
didn't feel respected, didn't feel like my ideas were welcome. Uh, it was a really boring scene in uh, North Carolina. And I really love teaching people. And I love getting on stages and showing people cool demos of things I made with my comic skills and HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And I had opportunities to travel the world and teach people and get to know people, make friends and see the world. I chose to do that for eight years. I mean, I look back and I'm like, you could have had a six figure job. You could have been putting that money in a 401k. You could be like, my retirement is taken care of right now. And what are you doing today? But the truth is, I didn't get to go live in London. I lived in Amsterdam. I formed these connections that will last a lifetime and I truly value them. It was a good use of my life that my teenage self would have been proud of because you only get to go around this world once. You know, you only get one lifetime and I'm glad that I spent it in the places that mattered to me. And now I'm spending it in a thing that matters to me even more. And I think this is a good thing to touch on now. Life's mission. We talk about enough as like a monetary number, but not everything is a number. And you know, there's all kinds of numbers here. Maybe it's views, hits, subscribers, uh, total paying users monthly. Uh, there are all kinds of numbers that you can try to hit in your frameworks. But then there are intangible things like living in Europe and having access to trains. Uh, and these are, or for instance, teaching the world how to acquire the skills to get six-figure jobs so that they can make those decisions for themselves without having to go to MIT or Berkeley or spend a lot of money on a boot camp. My personal mission. And I kind of pick my, I pick my battles now based on how much impact I'm going to have scaling knowledge to other people. That's why you see me bouncing from project to project like this. It's a, like Johnny Appleseed of, uh, of code, sort of, and that aligns with my personal mission. And when I'm evaluating different opportunities, you know, do I want to make a lot of money as a, you know, a, sil a shill for, for something that I don't really believe in and just trying to get people to buy it? Or can I actually teach people how to have their own, uh, solve their own problems as I like to think of it? I lean more in that direction. I have this compass uh, of my personal mission that helps tilt my, my hand in my, my direction according to a higher calling. And it gives me a lot of validation. And it sounds like you have your own higher calling that you're following, your own life's mission that you're delivering uh, on for the universe. Yeah, very much so. I. An interesting way to frame this. I've always felt like there's a point in one's growth where growth is no longer a thing that they do themselves in the same way. Like as an engineer, you hit a point in your career where growing isn't increasing the amount of code you can put out. It's actually decreasing it. And there's a point you hit even further from there where it's setting up systems and collaborating with others to make the whole system and all the people working in it more productive. Like growth as an engineer isn't just increasing your code output. It isn't getting to enough code. It's expanding your impact beyond yourself. And you're describing that here too with your goals with developer education. It's not just get to a point where you could build the things you want or even the like one technology that you like has better resources, but you want to improve how all developers learn. And that's your enough now. It's not about yourself anymore. It's how, it's almost like you've gotten to enough yourself. How can you help others get there too? Now, I think enough for me still involves like trains, trains to places I haven't been before, trains to friends I want to reconnect with. Um, and that's very difficult to find on the West Coast in the United States. So I have conflicting enoughs. I have the enough of teaching the world to code and empowering them to build their own solutions. But I also have the enough of, you know, sitting on trains, uh, having a, a lovely place to live that I can walk to a bakery and get freshly baked bread in the morning. And that, that's a life goal of mine. And I'll return to it. But sometimes you look out and you say, ah, Here's an opportunity. Hang on, I got this. I'm, I'm, I'll be right back. I gotta go do this. I gotta go. I'll be right back. And you you run off and you do it. And it doesn't last forever. What you're doing right now, I feel, will not last forever. You'll find your number. You'll find your price. You'll hand things off. 
maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in five years, but eventually it'll be over and you'll be moving on to some other enough. And that is natural. That is the way of things. Everything has changed. You cannot live forever and run your company forever. So expect it and figure out as you're going what you want in addition to that. I have some ideas. That said, we're seven months in. I'm going to focus on this for the time being, but absolutely. Uh, I will make a better DAW someday. It's way too hard to make music, and you should be able to do it in your browser, and I'm frustrated you can't. That's decades away, but we'll get there when we get there. One framing I really liked here is the idea of like leaving in enough behind. Something I talk about a bit and I think about way too much is the idea of like growth versus comfort mindset. Like, Are you seeking a place Ooh. where you're comfortable, or are you seeking a place that's better than the place you were before and which of those is like the driving force for you and for me enough the idea kind of felt like it leaned comfort inherently and it was like a a, a kinder framing to comfort mindset for me because i've always been like pretty anti comfort mindset but the way you put it there of enough is it's almost a place rather than a goal it's not the thing you're trying to get to it's the position you get yourself to knowing you can get back there. So for me, enough was the knowledge that I could be a successful software engineer. If this company fails, everything goes to hell. My connections are at a point where I could confidently go get a very nice salary at almost any company in the industry. That comfort isn't something I'm using. It's not I, like I'm comfortable with that fact. I'm not lavishing or living in that by having one of those jobs. It's I, I'm transforming it from a couch to a safety net in a way where the comfort of this position I'm in could be used to chill, but instead I'm using it to be the right place to fall. And I feel like enough can be positioned in a way to be used as a safety net in that way. Like if what you're doing now stresses you out too much and you realize this isn't what you're looking for, you can find a nice cottage near a bakery and you know that. And it almost feels like enough is a safety net here. That's not a thing you aspire to. It's a thing you know you can get to at any point. Enough is kind of like knowing where your baseline is and knowing where your stretch goals could be. Uh, this is why I was saying like, it's important to know what your numbers are. You know, what is the minimum you need to survive? What does that look like? What's the maximum you need to be ridiculously happy and have every single thing you want in the world? And then when you have a thing where you have an opportunity where it's like, well, I could give up the money that lets me have everything that I want. And I can fall back to that baseline. And I know it's going to be enough. I'm not going to lie awake at night and be scared or worry about my kids or my future. Because I've done the math and this is survivable in a worst case scenario. It's not the end of the world. Um, and you can make really smart decisions if you know that you've got enough, you are enough, you're doing enough, and you can take this bet. You can afford to take a little bit of risk. And maybe the risk pays off. Maybe you deliver on your life's mission. Maybe you end up getting to that super big number that lets you do anything that you want. Who knows? Uh, but when you understand what enough is for you, it frees you to take those bets. It frees you to understand when those bets are or aren't paying off. If I were working on a project that wasn't helping people learn, it would not be meeting that next milestone for me of helping people learn. I would look at it and I'd be like, well, when I hold it up against my price for investing my time in this project, I can see that it's not enough. I'm going to have to make a different bet because in the last six months, this project has been unsuccessful and I gave it a six month timer. So I'm going to go find another way to deliver on my life's mission. And that gives you that framework. But yeah, enough is that knowing you can continue onward and, and not fail. You know, that horrible, horrible saying, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? When you know what enough is, when you, you kind of do that. I saw a question in chat and I think that there's I'm trying to remember the way to frame this. The, the question was, how do you like when you're in the chaos of like your early days of freelancing, having not had a, a job, how do you find the first like role that is enough? I I'm going to challenge the framing of this a bit. 
do you think enough is the right thing to be thinking in for that first role or is getting in the door more important than having a specific like floor in mind so the secretary problem is an excellent framework for thinking about this to kids in the audience who are not familiar with the secretary problem there's a great book called algorithms to live by which does a great introduction to some of these and you can impress your computer science uh, grad friends by trotting them out from time to time. But for those who aren't familiar, the secretary problem is, say you are hiring a new employee, a secretary, and you've got a little queue of them lined up outside the door, ready to come in the interview, and you have the option right then and there to hire them or let them go. And if you let them go, you can't get them back. How many people do you interview before you make uh, a hire? And, you know, you, the problem is that you kind of need a finite number of secretaries to work this problem, right? Or candidates. Uh, but it, it's like you have to go through something like uh, somebody's going to correct me in chat, like 70% of the line. It's almost like you might as well flip a coin. But uh, the point is, even if the first person you interview sounds amazing, you have no one to compare them to. You have no way of measuring if this person is right. Anybody who walked through the door who wasn't a complete nightmare would be an amazing person because it's the first secretary you've seen. And this is why you never are the first person to apply for a job. Uh, so uh, there are things that you can do to help increase the likelihood that, you know, like reduce the number of people you have to interview. Like you can be looking for a set of criteria, have a measuring stick in mind already. Do you have these certifications? What's your grade point average? Okay, great. We kind of understand where you fall on a bell curve now. Thank you. We'll make that higher. We do quantifiably know that this is a good bet to make. And it's unlikely to find anybody beyond this because uh, you're number 30 in the line. We're unlikely to find many people better than you in the rest of the queue. So cancel everything, you're hired. And this is kind of what it's like when you're just starting in your career. You're the person and each one of these opportunities is the secretary. And you don't know if you want to hire this person or not, if you want to commit to this. The best thing you can do is adopt an experimental framework. You're a freelancer, your first gig came through, commit to about three to six months worth of time there, and move on, no matter how good it is, move on to the next, do another one, do another one, create the framework that brings more in the door, get it from different sources, not just your one supplier, always be working on people who are supplying you, because you might find that your buddy from college gets you great like $100 an hour work, but your buddy from grad school gets you $200 an hour work, and you won't know that if you're just doing your college buddies work. So keep that experimental mind, do lots of rapid iterations. Don't commit early, like don't marry the first person you date. Uh, you wanna try many different things so that you have an idea of what is best in life. And then you can start saying, you know, as much as I like cash, I learn so much when I work with the people in R&D, or I really enjoy the feeling of being involved in a startup and I'd like to be a co-owner. So I'm going to continue in that direction. But you don't know unless you try it. And because our time is finite, experience is the most valuable thing you can take with you into the rest of your career. And it's a great time to start building that experience today. Couldn't agree more. I, this is resonating with the community a lot. I don't know if you have chat open, but a handful of people are saying that this has been super helpful for them with where they're at now and figuring out what enough means as they level themselves up and start ch taking on their first or possibly even their last roles for some of them. And it's, yeah, I think this is an important conversation for a lot of us to have. And I know that I definitely haven't thought about this enough. I <laughs> definitely don't think about enough enough. I think it's important. I mean, even if it's hypothetical, you don't have to hold yourself to any of the numbers that you write down. What it can help you see how you've changed your stance on things. Like how much would it take for you to sell your project? The number you wrote down today is not the same one you're gonna write down in two years. And that might surprise you. You might look back and be like, I can't believe I thought it was worth that. And I just sold it for so much more and we're doing such amazing things now. I really underestimated this idea. Or you might have a different opinion, but by recording that your sense of valuation your sense of risk can really mature and finesse and cause you to be a more shrewd person who can get to that life mission faster and deliver on it better. Absolutely. I, 
I can't think of a better place to end this, honestly. As much as I want to go talk about crazy game dev tech stuff, this is this conversation is way more valuable than any nerdy tech stuff we can go into now. I have had you for over an hour and a half. Is there anything else you wanted to chat about that we didn't get to? Yeah, I have another piece of advice for people who are thinking about going into corporate work. And this is something that, um, you know, I'm actually new to working corporate jobs. I've only been doing this for like four or five years. It's very weird and different. But you might at one point think, yeah, I want a, a job job at a place where they have frameworks to measure if I'm a success or not. At large fang companies, there's a trap that you, I don't know how many of people in your audience idealize the fang career path. How, how many of your viewership? Give me an estimate. I, what do you think percentages? Way less than half idealize it. A handful of them are doing it. And if anything, there are a handful that do it or that are in fang and feel a tiny bit of shame for it not because it's like we're shaming them for it but because we're very much we're like a shame. entrepreneur -y community and like open source focused type place at this point and i push back on it i think it's like fang's awesome and there's a lot of huge opportunities but i i would say this community I mean, is less fang obsessed than average compared to like another uh, creator i do a decent bit of content with danny thompson he's really focused on like junior devs and getting them started most of his audience their question is how do i get my interview at fang how do i pass my interview at fang where this community is not as much that to be honest i think that's the correct way to go about it i'm on blind i follow the conversation i also have worked with some amazing engineers in my time and i gotta tell you my favorite engineers are the ones who come from unconventional backgrounds or they come from like University of Waterloo. You know, if you just want to be an amazing, amazing, amazing engineer and good at math, go there. Uh, just, just, just go, go learn. Learning in its own right is enough. I've had uh, so many Waterloo but, grads. Oh my god! It's like I hate to be this biased. I'm like, don't be biased. But I, I'm also like, but I know I'm going to love this person. And, uh, you know, it's just, I'm going to be impressed. It's, it's like, no, no, everyone has to prove themselves individually. You can't be biased. I can't help it. I've just met so many amazing Waterloo grads. But anyway, uh, unconventional career paths, unconventional backgrounds, unconventional passionate opinions. I have found that oftentimes people who leave FANG end up starting really cool I mean, you, you left trying to end up starting really cool startups and they have the engineering chops and the mind for scale like and product. I learned a lot about engineering on React Core at Meta and now I'm learning a, an awful lot about scaling backend services and product uh, at Amazon. And like these are things that help me learn and grow and add more things to my Swiss army knife of things I know how to do, mindsets and internalized models. There's nothing wrong with starting with or mid-careering, or even ending in fang. The people you meet can come with you throughout your lifetime. They can actually help you on the entrepreneurial road. So I, there's no shame in this. And for the people who are here who are thinking, oh, I'm, in, I, I'm in fang, or I'm thinking about the big job, not even fang, but just like big tech, you know, the corporate hierarchy, and you're on a career ladder, and they're not just gonna say, hey, you wanna do product? Sure, cool, go join that team. They're gonna be like, well, you have to reloop for that, and you'll be down level. Are you sure you want to be down leveled? Oh my gosh, it's so hard to maneuver inside these corporate lumbering giants. It's so hard. So, oh, oh, or or they lowball you. You didn't think to hire a professional negotiator because you didn't know that was a thing. It is a thing. Um, get yourself a professional negotiator if you're actually going to start landing some offers. Go search for it. Ask for recommendations. I'm a big fan of Josh Duty. He has an online course. Invest in it. Invest in your career. Learn how to ask for what you need. There's also a great book called Ask For It, which is specifically targeted at women, but it really applies to anyone who's just felt shy about stating their needs and getting them met. That applies to so many minorities and many shy nerd boys. So, it's a great book. Read it. It'll make you do things like awkwardly ask for discounts in stores where you'll never see those people again to get you used to for ask, uh, get you used to asking for shit when you're not used to being a problem for anybody. Anyway, when you get inside these things, there are you're you're gonna be tempted to get on that hedonic treadmill. 
oh, if you just deliver these things, you'll be up for promotion, maybe, if the stars align. You know what I'm talking about, Theo. I fell oh, for the so you just keep running on that treadmill. You can do it. We believe in you. Bring your whole self to work. You've got this. You know, when you join, make sure you're appropriately leveled. Use levels.fyi. Use blind. Compare notes with other people. Talk to them. Share what you're making with one another. Really see if you can get that measuring stick uh, so that you're going into that secretary problem armed and you know, like, this is where I'm going to land. And if you hear yourself saying, but I'll prove myself when I'm in that role, stop. Nobody, like, the machine loves to get you when you don't know your worth. It loves to hang on to you like that uh, because, you, you, you know, it's a good deal for them. They make a lot like that. On that note in particular, so I have to jump in on that one. I've been on the other side of it. I have hired oh, yeah. people that were lower, lower level than they should have been hired in. The process as a manager to get them promoted and to like go to your managers and say, hey, we hired this person at the wrong level. We need to level them up. The response is why we got them like, yeah, right. it sucks. It sucks so hard. And I've run into so many problems where we like on the safety team at Twitch, we hired I was the only male on the team, which was a really awesome, interesting experience. We had changed our hiring pipe entirely and added the rule that to hire someone new, we had to interview at least one marginalized candidate in the role before we made a hiring decision. And all of a sudden, all the teams were really diverse because the marginalized person with the same resume as the non-marginalized -mar person had to work so much harder. So they end up being better almost every time. So I ended up on a team where I was the only dude. And what I learned quickly was my role here is to shout at leadership because these girls are getting way more shit than they deserve because they're recent grads from random colleges and they're soft spoken. And this is a company of like big, like loud dudes. Mm -hmm. I have to use my role here to make sure they don't get left behind in the leveling system. And it's so exactly. common that that happens, especially if you're hired in at the wrong level. One of the recommendations I make a lot, you touched on like the six month window, do an interview every six months with somebody somewhere, even if you're totally happy with your job, just to have a number, a have the process, stay on top of things. Like you should be interviewing a ton. Every person in my community should fail at least one interview this year. I'll be disappointed in you if you don't. Every one of you. Sorry for the interview. It means you're batting too low. You know, you're 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 aiming too low. If you can keep, uh, if you're not failing any interviews, aim higher. Aim higher. You know, aim for the senior role. Aim for the, and the manager role. Uh, I love that. That is great advice. And what you're saying is true. Once you're in the system, it's hard to do that. I make sure that I'm properly leveled. What is it? Properly leveled. Properly compensated. Because the last thing you want to do is be halfway through delivering on this project that delivers for your life mission, and suddenly find out oh my God, I'm not getting that raise that they promised me when I joined because I took less because I was so excited to be working with, you know, this product, these people, this thing that got stars in my eyes. Be selfish, put yourself first, make sure you're getting the best deal for you because then you can just focus on delivering. You can focus on doing the thing that you came to do. You're not playing the promotion game. You can be completely customer focused. You can just focus on the good work and all the manipulative stuff that the machine might do to, and also I gotta tell you, a lot of the stuff people do for promo actually isn't good for the customer. It, it ends up putting you know, office politics ahead of team delivery. And so when you take all of that stuff, the whole treadmill and the career ladder off the table and you just go in with the, I'm gonna do good work here for two or three years. If I do great work and you wanna promote me and keep me, I expect you to do that, but I will be moving on to the next really cool project when, I'm, when I have delivered on the mission that I came here to do. You come in like that, it doesn't matter if you end up with a new director or things are changed or all the churn that can happen during your career. You have your North Star, you have your compass, you know where you're going and people can line up behind you and you can do the right thing. So I just wanted to say that for anyone who's thinking about getting into corp, there is a way you can do it and you can still deliver for the, the things that you believe in. You just gotta ignore the, the frequent flyer mile program that is the promo game, et cetera, inside. Trust if you do good work, opportunities will line up for you. I really like that way of putting it. I strive really hard in like the teams I run and now the companies I manage to make sure every person has 
the mindset you described, like how to individually get to here of like not having to worry about your salary, your benefits, your role, any of those things. So you could be focused on what you're there for, which is the users and building solutions and solving problems. It's the same reason that at my like tiny startup where I'm making the least money I've made since I used to work at a corn maze and I'm eating ramen again. We have the best healthcare I've ever had in my life. And I think it's really important as a company that we do things like that as expensive as they may be, because it's one less thing for the team to worry about when they take the crazy risk of joining this startup and solving these problems for our users. I don't want the other problems to drag that down and keep them from being focused on the users. Like, what does it take for you to... It's like, what does it take? It's how do I make these things not the problem? And I feel like at companies that are bigger than like what we're doing here, you have to do that yourself. And even at other smaller companies where the leaders aren't as conscious of this, you still have to. And being your advocate for your baseline so you can focus on your role and what you're supposed to deliver is so important. And it's mm -hmm. missed a lot. And it, I guess it's, it's frustrating to me that this is something that we have to recommend the employees do, even like recommending the professional negotiator. Like it sucks that that's necessary because the leadership won't do it. And I, I still feel like this is the responsibility of leaders and to all the other senior developers here listening, try and do this for the people you hire, like try to make these things easier, get in front of these problems so that a potential hire that might not know any of these things can still be in the better boat. And maybe for the first time in their lives, they've never had to worry about their healthcare. And those tiny things can make such a huge difference. Absolutely. And in a leadership position, if you want your team to be happy to be in a de-stress, not fear-based mindset, you're going to have to think of different ways that you can get in front of the bus for them, that you can you know, reroute and derail any negative policies or knock-on effects that might be coming for them. You are functioning in a less than ideal situation. I remember once I started going up in seniority, I, there was this period of time where I remember going on a test interview like you do, and I realized in that interview that one of the examples of a situation I'd given, I had deflected, like, well, I couldn't have succeeded in that role because I wasn't set up for success. And I remember thinking, yeah, but you're not a baby puppy anymore. You're a big dog. People don't set you up for success. You've got to set other people up for success. That's your job now. You're never going to come into a situation and directors are going to have set you up for success if it was easy someone else would be in your role because it would already be solved. They hire people to do hard things. And sometimes that hard thing is just providing that safe space for people to do their best work and to focus on being their best selves every day. And that is really hard work. I think that I couldn't imagine a better note to end it on. I'm happy that we took the time to go on this one last 20 minute tangent. This has been one of the best shows I've ever done for sure. I'm so thankful that we got to have you on, Rachel. For everybody who isn't already following Rachel, uh, I have in Twitch chat the Rachel Air Command. Go give them a follow. I'll send this over to YouTube as well so people there can see it. I'll have the VOD up on YouTube if you join late and miss the rest of this for any other reason. That'll be up. Super excited. Any last thoughts or words, things people should check out? Obviously, the new beta React docs. Obviously, beta.reactjs.org. Check it out. If you want to learn anything about user interface animation, I have a book called, uh, in, uh, oh my God. Oh no, I've forgotten the name of my own book. Thank you, COVID. That COVID fog. Uh, animation at Work from a Book Apart. And if you want to learn about how to animate things, I've got some courses about it at courses.rachelneighbors.com. And that is the last of the shilling that I'm going to do. Is anybody going to be going to OpenJS World in June in Austin? I will be there talking about developer education. I'll see you there. I am positive. I can think of at least four people in the chat right now that are going to be there. I, I, I can tell Jacob is shouting. Oh, there's the all caps. I live in Austin from Jacob. So yeah, <laughs> there will be a handful there. It's in June. If it's not during the week of VidCon, I might be able to find an excuse to sneak out as well. So. Wow, if you can take some time away from your entrepreneurial lifestyle, that would be awesome. I hope I'll All see you there. The, this is the cool thing about my job. This is my job. 
I'm building for creators. And the way we understand it is by being creators. We've even had people in the video chat on YouTube saying, oh my God, this looks better on 480p than the 1080p video I was watching before because of the tech you guys are using. And I like, I need to live this experience to understand what we're doing, how what we're doing is or isn't working. So yeah, thank you for spending the today on the job with me. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Theo. And thank you all for tuning in today. It's been a pleasure. Of course. Well, thank you guys again. Gonna kill it now. Peace out. Awesome. Wow. What an interview. So lucky that we got to have Rachel Lee on to talk all about developer education and growth and all the other cool stuff we chatted about. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, and send it to a few friends. I think a lot of people could benefit from the stuff we talked about here, and I would love for more developers to see all the awesome stuff Rachel had to bring. They were an incredible guest, and I can't thank them enough for coming on the show. Thank you again, Rachel, and thank you, everybody who's watched this video. And also, huge shout out to Des, my editor, for jumping on all this stuff. He's been killing it lately. Thank you, man.